So I'm uh, Dr. Nick Campion from the University of Wales Trinity St David and this talk deals with the uh, management of the state by using uh, astronomy and astrology in the Middle Ages. Uh, a, a feature of medieval politics that is actually often left out of histories of medieval politics or histories of medieval political theory. And I'm going to take a, a broad sweep. So because obviously people in the Middle Ages argued a huge amount according to authority, they looked back to previous works, particularly classical works, in order to justify their actions and ideas. And I'm actually going to go through to what I would consider to be the end of medieval cosmology at the beginning of the 17th century. And we'll have some specific examples as well of how uh, astronomy, astrology might be applied to specific examples of political management. So, to start off with, uh, my theme, just to reiterate, how were the stars and planets used to manage history and politics? Um, the, the branch of astrology which uh, was used to manage history and politics uh, was known as revolutions after the revolutions of the planets as the planets revolve around the earth in fact the the use of the word revolution in order to describe a political upset uh, probably derives from that use of the word revolution to describe changes that happen when the planets move so let's start off with a bit of theory. Uh, going back to the Greek philosopher Empedocles in the 500s, there was an idea that the universe alternates between two kinds of uh, existence. And so Empedocles derived something which we now call the cosmic cycle. And he saw the universe as consisting of the four elements, fire, earth, air, and water, but they're constantly in a state of movement. And so they come together uh, at in a, in a state of perfect balance, and then they move to extremes where they sort of fly apart. And uh, at the points at which they move to their extremes and fly apart, the universe dissolves. And at the point at which they are balanced, the universe is perfectly balanced. And between the extremes, the universe moves between love and strife, or harmony and discord, we might say. And so there's constant alternation between two modes of existence. And at key points, the universe dissolves. And so history, or the life of the world, the life of the universe, will start again. So an endless cycle of endings and beginnings. And we know about this partly because of Aristotle. And so Aristotle's works were translated into Latin in the 12th century and so deeply familiar to medieval theorists. And Aristotle uh, said, the constitution of the world is of necessity such that love and strife alternately predominate and cause motion while in the intermediate period of time there is a state of rest. So, in other words, history will end for a period of stability, then suddenly speed up, and there'll be uh, chaos and crisis, and then it'll enter a state of rest again. Um, Edward Grant, whose book Planet, Stars and Orbs is probably the most comprehensive book on medieval cosmology in English, said... Aristotle's love was an impersonal force, just as were the intelligences, angels, impetuses, and souls. Um, I'd like to qualify his use of the word uh, impersonal there, because, as I see it, the, the entire medieval cosmos was, in fact, personal. In the Christian world, it was ruled over by a personal God, and from that personal God flowed everything else that was personal. The planets were moved by angels, Angels have a personal relationship with the planets, and planets have personal relationships with people. But one could use that word impersonal almost 
in the same sense as we now have the word transpersonal. Um, they, it, 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 it's beyond the individual. Uh, like angels, like souls, like intelligences, love exists beyond individual existence. It's above and beyond us all. And then from Plato, this passage from the Timaeus was familiar in the medieval world. Uh, Plato talked about what he called the complete year. And the complete year is the time in which it takes all the seven known planets, the Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, to arrive back simultaneously at the points at which they were uh, created. And uh, Plato didn't specify this time. Various readings of his works argue for a period of, say, 36,000 years. That's not important. What's important is the idea of a complete unit of time at the end of which everything begins again. And this is the, um, the passage from Plato. The complete number of time fulfills the complete year when all eight circuits with their relative speeds finish together and come to a head when similarly measured by the revolution of the same and the similarly moving. We've got eight circuits there. The eighth circuit is the sphere of the stars. So seven planets plus the stars. And um, here where he refers to the same and the similarly moving, the same is the motion of the stars and the similarly moving the motion of the planets. So you've got all the stars and seven planets. There's a point of creation. When they all get back to that point, everything starts again. It's a complete year. And um, Plato's uh, cosmology was incredibly important to people such as uh, this man, Johann Kepler, in the 17th century. Um, and his cosmo Plato's cosmology was basically uh, geometrical. And he argued that ast astrology works because all things are part of an unfolding geometrical order. And so um, it's not particularly relevant uh, to think of the planets influencing life on Earth, although it was commonly assumed, according to Aristotle, that they did exert influences. What was far more important uh, was the unfolding of the whole universe according to a single scheme, a single mathematical geometrical scheme, which meant that if you projected astronomical positions forward in the future, you could reach uh, an understanding of what conditions on Earth might be like in the future. Nobody really questioned that in the Middle Ages. What they questioned was the amount of detail you could put into those predictions, whether you could just roughly say, oh, well, there'll be trouble, or whether you could say, such and such a king will be overthrown. So there's a great difference over the detail, but not over the principle that there's just a, gen a general unfolding um, the whole world could be described it's like a machina mundi, the, the, the world machine, in that there's a whole, a consistent movement that links everything, and that linkage means you can look at one part of the universe and decide what's happening in another. So you look at a planet, decides what's <coughs> happening on Earth. You can project a planetary position in the future, so therefore you've got an understanding of the future on Earth. Uh, it's, it's actually very... Uh, Logical, and this is the um, main basis for the for the compilation of astronomical tables uh, and 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 much of the astronomy that happened in the Middle Ages. Now, coming uh, from other classical philosophers, particularly from the Stoics, there's a belief that. Uh, from Empedocles, from Aristotle, from Plato, there will actually be a, a great conflagration, a real crisis, almost a, a millennial crisis at those points when history hits a changing moment. So these quotes from Diogenes Laertius. Um, first of all, he says, at stated periods of time, God absorbs into himself the whole of substance and again creates it from himself. So everything is absorbed back into God, and then God creates the universe again. 
and then the world must come to an end inasmuch as it had a beginning, the world itself is doomed to perish. So if the world had a beginning, time is finite, it must come to an end, even if it then begins again. So those kind of ideas then dovetail very neatly with uh, Christian ideas of a finite creation and a finite end of the world. Of course, those ideas also borrowed from uh, the Hebrew cosmology. Uh, what, of course, was very difficult to take on in a Christian perspective was the idea that God would then begin again and there'd be another world. And that would end, and another world after that. But Christianity could absorb these classical ideas into the notion of a single creation and a single destruction. Now, one of the, uh, the engines, one of the drivers of one of the most fundamental pieces of medieval political astronomy, political astrology, was uh, Persia. So, just you know, a bit of uh, chronology. Well, you know, the, the the Persian Empire in, in its great days is is very familiar from the story of Alexander the Great, who conquered the Persian Empire in in the the three thirties. Uh, but of course, Alexander the Great's empire uh, eventually disintegrated. Its successor states disintegrated and successor Persian empires were re-established uh, until the Arab conquest, the Islamic conquest in 651. And so, just in terms of the geography, uh, Persia, obviously, is midway between India and uh, the Near East and the Mediterranean. And so it has to be geographically the route through which all ideas pass between India and the Near East and the, Mid and the Mediterranean. Now, the, the, the Persian religion, uh, as is well known, had a huge uh, impact on Christianity. And so certain key ideas such as the existential struggle, the eternal existential struggle between good and evil, almost as powerful opposing forces, uh, was introduced into Christianity from Persian religion. Uh, we get this uh, idea here, this lovely phrase, cosmophobia, from Hans Jonas, uh, talking about the idea of the fear of the cosmos. The cosmos is essentially a place which can be threatening and can be evil. And it certainly could be evil uh, and threatening if darkness as opposed to light was uh, in the ascendant. And so uh, Persian religion was uh, Zoroastrian uh, and uh, attributed to, to the prophet uh, Zoroaster or Zarathustra dates probably in the second millennium BC, perhaps later, perhaps earlier, a figure whose uh, precise life is really overwhelmed by uh, mythology. But we do know that the uh, religion postulated this struggle between light and dark and the struggle between two deities, Ormazd or Ahura Mazda, the god of light, and uh, opposing him, the uh, let's say the Lord of Darkness. Um, here uh, on the left hand side uh, from uh, Persepolis, the Persian capital, is Ahura Mazda, the uh, Zoroastrian god of light, uh, floating on a winged sun disk there and a couple of other images. Uh, this image here from this uh, Sasanian rock relief in the 4th century, that character there is supposed to, with his son 
halo is thought to be a, a Zoroastrian priest. And here, a much later image, but to indicate the same point here, an image of uh, uh, Zarathustra with the radiant sun around his head. So, um, a, a primary source. This is an extract from chapter 12 of a Zoroastrian text talking about the uh, creation. And it says, and the creator Ormazd, that's the god of light, entrusted all the good things which are in this creation to Mithra and the moon and the twelve signs of the zodiac which are called by the religion the twelve commanders. So, signs of the zodiac. Here, the Persian translated as the twelve commanders. Suggesting here, the signs of the zodiac uh, perform a political role on behalf of the God of Light. This character on the right hand side here whoops, is uh, uh, <coughs> Zervan. And Zervan is normally talked about as uh, deified time. Carl Jung makes a great deal of uh, Zervan in some of his writings. A lion headed God wrapped in a, in a snake. But the idea of time as a deity. And I might say, I might say from this, time as an organising principle, which I think we can find in Plato, is also powerful in Zoroastrianism. So we then um, uh, lead from there to a very sympathetic attitude to astrology, because if the signs of the zodiac, uh, as the as the planets were, are created by the god of light, they serve him. They they, they do his will. And if time is an organising principle, as in Plato, I believe, and as in Zoroastrianism, then you need to look to the disposition of the planets at critical moments to decide what is happening. And from this developed in Persia we think, probably after the first century, we think, we think because actually the original texts are all lost, um, a view, a, a, a way of looking at history through astronomy, through the positions of the planets, in order to almost demonstrate that history has a purpose. So if you were to look at the disposition of planets at a particular moment, and they were meaningful, then you would demonstrate that whatever was associated with that moment had a purpose. It's part of the plan. So um, as an example, here is a version of the horoscope of the world. It's 9th century. Um, we find earlier examples actually in Latin literature. So for example, Julius Firmicus Maternus in the 4th century. Um, the, the fact that it occurred in Latin in the 4th century does not mean uh, it doesn't also have a Persian origin um, or a Persian contribution to the origin. And so this is the horoscope of the world. And so um, each planet uh, was located in its exaltation. Okay, so the planetary exaltations uh, date back, it seems, to uh, sometime in the Babylonian period, so perhaps... 6th century, 7th century BC, perhaps earlier, but there's evidence of them in the Babylonian period. And each planet is exalted in a particular zodiac sign, which means its functioning is particularly strong. And strong in a, in a usually in a, generally in a benevolent way. And so here is uh, Jupiter, it's in the sign of the crab cancer. And so every, and all the other six planets are also in their exaltations. And so they're all in a perfect position. There's a state of perfection. And so any other uh, point in history could be measured against this particular state of perfection. And if a planet is in its exaltation at any particular moment of history, then there's a little bit of perfection there. So if Jupiter happened to be in Cancer uh, at a later moment, then somehow there is, if you like, a, a ripple, an echo a, from the creation, a connection to the creation. 
a little, a little point of, of uh, a memory of, a, a, a connection to this original perfection, in which all the planets are functioning at their, their highest. Now we know about this uh, uh, Persian material, the idea, uh, this sort of historical astronomy, historical astrology, uh, from a few of the earliest writers in the uh, Arab period, particularly to Masha'Allah and Abu Mashah. So this, for example, a piece of, another piece of theory, this is Masha'Allah, on times. So this is uh, um, 8th century. Um, know that times excite motion and, and there is a beginning of motion which comes to be the circle up to the end of time. A time in which the hour is adapted to each motion that begins until it is ended with a complexion matching it or not matching it. Wherefore this signifies good or bad. So basically time excites motion. Um, time makes motion possible. In fact, time makes motion inevitable because as time passes, things must move, things must change. So time then is the prior principle and because time exists, motion is possible and when motion happens, good things might happen and bad things might happen. So you get auspicious times and inauspicious times. So the task of the political astronomer is to establish what is an auspicious time. And so this is from uh, the Bunda uh, the uh, or creation Zoroastrian text. Uh, this is online and this is chapter 34, paragraph 1. Time was for 12,000 years and it says in Revelation that 3,000 years was, was the duration of the spiritual state where the creatures were unthinking, unmoving, and intangible. And 3,000 years was the duration of Gaiamard. Gaiamard was the ideal, archetypal, perfect man, with the ox in the world. So as this was 6,000 years, we had 3 plus 3, the series of millennial reigns of Cancer, Leo, and Virgo had lapsed because it was 6,000 years when the millennium reign came to Libra. When it came to Libra, the adversary rushed in, the Lord of Darkness, Ahriman, rushed in, and Gaiamard lived 30 years in tribulation. So there's a great millennial crisis. Ahriman, Lord of Darkness, rushed in. So we've got 12,000 years for the life of the universe, 1,000 years for each zodiac sign. Quite a quite, uh, simple correspondence. And when it comes to Libra, we have the millennial crisis. So it's you know, widely thought that the, in, in the final book of the New Testament, Revelation, the great millennial crisis that's described there is largely influenced by Persian thinking. Now, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, the Bunda Hishn also says, Jupiter is the star of life and Saturn is the star of death. So they are, if you like, representing opposites. But of course, compatible opposites, because all life must be accompanied by death. Just as in the universe, love and strife alternate equally, and each is necessary. <clears throat> the Jupiter and Saturn have a particular quality, is that every 20 years, they form a conjunction. They come together in the same degree of the zodiac. And the pattern of conjunctions moves through the zodiac signs in a sequence and moves through the fire, earth, air and water signs in a sequence. So we have three zodiac signs attached to each element. So three fire signs, Aries, Leo and Sagittarius and so on. And three signs attached to each other element. So you get the movement of conjunctions through zodiac signs, through groups of zodiac signs, and then through the entire zodiac. And the entire sequence takes up to 960 years. 
which is only 40 years short of a thousand years. And so sometime, probably in the first century or after, the Persian astrologers decided that the Jupiter-Saturn cycle of conjunctions was therefore the key means by which this 12,000 year sequence of history could be understood. And by therefore looking at the positions of the planets at particular moments, you could establish whether that was an auspicious moment or not in terms of the creation. Because we knew where the planets were at their creation, all of their exaltations. From that, you can establish <coughs> the relative benevolence of any particular moment. Uh, this is from uh, Johann Kepler. This is basically, uh, you know, Kepler was, in the 17th century, was the last great exponent of this idea. And he uh, pointed out, as, as people already knew, but he made a great thing of this, that each conjunction takes place around a third of the zodiac from the previous one. So if the first one is here at the top, the second one is here, the third one here, back to the top, and so on. But, so you make a triangle. But there's a constant shift through the zodiac over the 960-year cycle, which means that they shift like this. And if you drew the whole pattern, you'd get this pattern. So you get a beautiful, harmonious pattern around a sphere in the middle. And of course, according to Plato, the universe is a sphere, uh, the creator, the, the, the great you know, consciousness, the, the God, the mind from which everything was created is a sphere. And so this diagram can then become an image of divinity, the totality of history. Everything is in this diagram, all possibilities in time and space. So <clears throat> back to Masha Aladdin on the roots of revolutions. Here's that word, revolutions. We've got this theory, this principle. How do we interpret it? So Masha Allah uh, <coughs> said, here, know that the greatest things and those to be marvelled at happen from the conjunction of the superior planets. So the superior planets are actually Saturn, Jupiter, but also there we add in Mars as a superior planet. But Jupiter and Saturn are the most important. And this comes on account of the slowness of their motion. They move slowly as we see them from the Earth. Um, Jupiter takes 12 years to make a complete cycle of the zodiac as seen from the Earth. Saturn, 29 years. And therefore, they represent slow moving trends. And their complete 960 year cycle is therefore you know, the slow movement of history. But then we can be more precise. If the sun joins them, or if they're in for particular bands or faces, which are subdivisions of zodiac signs, they will signify the destruction of sects and kingdoms and the changing of them and prophecies. So political and religious upheaval will come about when Jupiter, Saturn make their conjunctions and precisely in association with other planets as well, which we'll see in a moment. And so this, then this is Abu Masha, around the same time as Masha Allah. We say that when the conjunction of the two superior planets, so two superior planets here, Jupiter and Mars, <coughs> necessitates something in the changes of religions and dynasties, the change of the Sharias and the Sunnas, the occurrence of important matters, the change of the kingdom, the death of kings, the kinds of occurrence of prophets, revelation, miracles in religions and dynasties. So even the dispute between um, different um, uh, Islamic groups or ideas about Islamic law were uh, important um, at the time and could fall, fall into the grand scheme of history. 
And again, this is Abu Mashar. Again, I've quoted, I've quoted here this uh, long passage, and here he refers to the three superior planets. So this is Jupiter and Saturn, and including Mars. Um, so we have the three superior planets, uh, which indicate things which last a long time. The middle, that's the sun, which indicates powerful kings. So if a king is in, if the sun is involved with Jupiter and Saturn, a king may be overthrown. And then we have the uh, inferior planets, which are here, um, Mercury, Venus, and the moon, to whom belongs the indication of things which last a lesser time. Now, Saturn indicates religions and kingdoms and whatever lasts a long time here. Jupiter, observations of laws, decrees, and the like. And then Mars, wars and conquests. Venus, marriage, clothes, and the like. Mercury, writings, calculations, and the like. The moon, movement, changes of location, and pilgrimages, and the like. So you then have a sort of hierarchy of interpretation whereby Jupiter and Saturn give you the big picture. And as you move down the hierarchy to the faster and faster moving planets, you get more and more detail. So if you look at Venus, you might say, well, fashions will change. And then you get to the moon and you've got very uh, fast changes. With which it doesn't, it's not really helpful. Changes of location and pilgrimages and the like, says Abu Mashar, which is not particularly helpful. So we've got metaphysical tensions here. There is a tension, an undoubted tension, because in Islamic orthodoxy, the world is created once. And God has supreme power. It's not created many times by a God who, whose uh, law and word exists within zodiacal changes. Because what the Persian theory is saying is every time we get a significant Jupiter-Saturn uh, alignment, uh, conjunction, then there may be a new prophet. There may be a new religion. And so all religions are relative. You've got Egyptian religion, Babylonian religion, Jewish religion, Christian religion, pagan religion, Islamic religion. It's all relative. And yet these ideas exist in the Islamic world and are then imported into, the, into medieval Christianity. And they exist in this kind of uncomfortable parallel world along with religious orthodoxy. And because they're somehow kind of plausible about them, they're not stamped out. As long as you don't challenge ecclesiastical authorities too loudly, you won't be persecuted. There's something very plausible about this idea of grand patterns and cyclical unfolding. But there is undoubtedly a metaphysical tension. Another interesting point, by the way, just an anecdote here, is that in this system, as set out by Masha Allah, the age of the world is 360,008 years, and, the, and uh, a complete cycle lasts 360,008 years and 318 days. Now, um, it's commonly thought and you will find this quoted everywhere, that until the early 19th century, people in Christian world anyway, thought that the world was created in 4004 BC. And, and, and in the 19th century, along came for ge geologists and astronomers and said, no, the universe is much older than that. Well, actually, the, that age of 4004 BC was only worked out by Archbishop Usher in the, and, and uh, one of his then one of his colleagues in the 17th century, in the, in back here in medieval Islam and imported into Christianity, was the idea that actually the world is 360,000 years old. So that's just, just an interesting uh, slant on 
discussions about the age of the universe, which don't make it into modern discussions. So here is Masha'Allah's horoscope indicating the birth of Christ. Now it indicates the birth of Christ because nobody knew when Jesus Christ was born. So, but what you could do is because the astronomical movements are paramount, look to the astronomy and the rules of astronomy, astrology, to look at for a horoscope which indicates the birth of Christ. And so, uh, if you see this symbol here, that's the sun. The sun is at zero degrees of Aries, which means it's uh, the beginning of the uh, astronomical year, the spring equinox. A point, an important astronomical point. And so in this system, you could look at that point, look at where the planets are, and those planets will tell you what is going on. So if we go forward then, this is the interpretation. Um, we have here, this is Libra, this symbol at the top, that little, little letter there, H, stands for horoscope. That is actually the uh, eastern horizon. It's the, um, it might be at the top there, but actually it's the eastern horizon. It's in Libra. So this is how Masha Allah read this horoscope. He said, okay, Libra is rising. The rising sign is always crucial. Um, Saturn is found in its exaltation in Libra. It's not actually in Libra here, but the very fact that Libra is the sign where Saturn is exalted is auspicious. It shares in a little bit of that perfection of the world horoscope. Masha'Allah doesn't say that. He just gives the bare facts about Saturn. I'm extrapolating and saying it shares in a little bit of the, the world horoscope. Also, uh, Saturn is also in Capricorn here the sign which it rules. So it's happy there as well. It's strong. And also Saturn then becomes, he's decided, the lord of the horoscope. It's the lord of the birth of Jesus Christ. And also the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter all make aspects to Saturn, which means that, just to explain that, Jupiter in Virgo is a third of the zodiac away from Saturn. Uh, Venus is a third away, the Sun and Mercury um, in Aries a quarter away. They're all linked. So that they're all focusing on Saturn. They're all looking at Saturn. And Saturn is in its own sign and Libra, Sun of its ex exaltation is, is right. So Masha Allah says this is a good horoscope. So this is quite, it's, it's, it's in a way that Think about this, it's quite amazing stuff. Here is this Persian astrologer in the Islamic world looking at the horoscope for Christ and saying, yes, this is, this is meant. This is, in a way, a horoscope which I'm saying, he thought, shares in a little bit of that perfection of the world horoscope. The only things which, the only discordant point here is here's the moon and here's Mars. Mars, a violent planet. This zone here is the ninth house which rules religion and so this then indicates Christ's violent end, the crucifixion. So even the crucifixion is here signified by the horoscope signifying his birth. So that's how the Persian astrologers were thinking and that's the astrology that was imported into Christian Europe and then sat in this, uh, developed this strange and I think kind of unexplored relationship with Christian orthodoxy. This is a, a parallel world view. <coughs> Some people cross between orthodox worldviews and astrological ones. Um, but really, in, in an abstract sense, those two views are incompatible. So we've got this strange, you know, a parallel cosmology so you can inhabit one or the other. So that's just a nice diagram. I like it's 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 quite. This looks to me 16th century, but anyway, it just indicates the, the uh, a nice indication of Saturn there, Jupiter there. Uh, this is their rising. 
trajectory, they're here, roughly in conjunction. They're joined by Mercury. Mercury rules, as we've already seen, calculation and contract. So an astrologer would say changes in the law. So going forward into Europe, then this material all enters Europe in the 12th and 13th centuries. And we then start very rapidly getting uh, astrology books appearing, such as the book of the division of astronomy in its four parts, written by the English astrologer in the 1170s, Roger of Hereford. He then comes up with this sort of geocultural astronomy, which is my term, I'm calling it that. Aries and Jupiter rule the land between Babel, or Babylon, and Herach. Libra and Saturn rule the land of the Christians. Scorpio and Venus rule the Arabs. Capricorn and Mercury, India, and so on. Uh, Leo and Mars, the Turks. Aquarius and the Sun, Babylon. Virgo and the Moon rule Spain. So we have, again, a, a relativization of religion um, and culture, whereby each has a different combination of zodiacal and planetary rulerships, which you can then use by looking at the movement of the planets with zodiac signs to identify strengths and weaknesses in each, or the rise and fall of each, which might be dominant, which might be um, submissive. And we get lots of other versions, often related to each other. So Adelard of Bath, Saturn rules the Jews, Venus and Mars rule the Arabs, the Sun and Jupiter rule the Christians. Then Michael Scott, Saturn rules pagans and Jews, Jupiter rules Christians. Uh, and so on. William of Auvergne, Saturn rules Jews, Venus rules Islam, the Sun rules Christianity. And sometimes there's a very simple uh, logic here. Uh, Saturn rules Jews, well, the Jewish Sabbath is Saturday, ruled by Saturn. Venus rules Islam, well, Muslims uh, attend prayers in the mosque on Friday. Friday is ruled by Venus, and Christians go to church on Sunday. It's the great feast day, the weekly feast day, ruled by the sun. So, um, Jupiter-Saturn conjunction is interpreted. Every, you know, we, we, get, we got to a situation where every 20 years there'd be a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction which could be um, interpreted. So, for example, going forward to 1325, this is from Lynn Thorndike, uh, paraphrasing uh, Geoffrey of Moe, um, a Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars conjunct in Aries. The future time will be very prone to marvellous occurrences. It signifies grudges, hatred, seditions, treacherous machinations, deception, worry, war, and disease. Many will incline to incredulity. That's a very important statement. People will be gullible. They'll believe what you tell them. There's a mass psychology going on here. A collective psychology. What might happen? Oh, there might be some preacher on the loose or prophet is going to tell you things which you believe. And they will adhere to sorcery and heresy. So heresy ar might arise under this conjunction. So again, there's, under this conjunction, you might be tempted into sin, tempted away from the path of truth and Christ. And then we get down to mundanities. Uh, there will be novelties within the church and general restlessness Prices will go up. I like that because then we come down to real specific, which of course is critical. If prices go up, the price of bread grows up, it probably means there's scarcity, you know, lots of famine drought, and then political unrest. So actually, prices going up is a nice little piece of that specific prediction, but perhaps indicating much wider problems. Um, and people look back to interpret to retrospectively to see what had happened with these conjunctions. And so, 1345, there was a Saturn-Jupiter-Mars conjunction in Aquarius, and subsequently Abbot Trithemius in the 15th century wrote that the Black Death of 1348 had been predicted on this basis. And that was then an example of a correct prediction, which meant a, you should pay attention to this material. Right through to Martin Luther, um, there were some prophecies produced, I think, in the 15th century by a man called Lichtenberger, who, which forecast the birth of the Messiah in 1484. Now, by um, 1517, Martin Luther 
had uh, initiated what we what came to be called the Reformation, the great challenge to the Roman Catholic Church in um, Europe. And Luther uh, commissioned a, a new publication of Lichtenberger's publications. And uh, astrologers also relocated Luther, Luther's birth year from 1483 to 1484 in order to uh, allow Luther to be the prophet forecast by uh, Lichtenberger on the basis of the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction of 1484. So it was active manipulation, okay, not just prediction, but active manipulation on the basis of the fact that people paid a great deal of attention to these uh, predictions. This active manipulation it is rather reminiscent of what happened with uh, Joseph Goebbels, actually, who manipulated Nostradamus in order to demonstrate the uh, inevitability of Nazi power. So let's go back then from Luther to Adelard of Bath. Okay? <clears throat> One of the earliest of the new wave of translators, philosophers and astronomers. Um, he uh, travelled widely. He visited Syria. He was uh, the, the tutor of Prince Henry. Prince Henry was the son of Queen Matilda, the rightful Queen of England. There was a civil war going on in England. Matilda was the Queen. Uh, there was a rebellion by uh, King Stephen, who, because he was a man, regarded himself as rightful King. Matilda was constantly on the on the, on the defensive, never really, never ruled. Uh, her son, who then became King Henry II, was tutored in Bristol by Adelard. And um, Adelard wrote a famous treatise on the astrolabe, almost certainly dedicated to the young Henry. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm relying here partly on John North, whose work is largely unquestioned, for example, by Charles Burnett at the Warburg Institute. This is a frontispiece of um, a later edition of Aristotle's, uh, Adelard's translation of Euclid's Elements. Just, you know, that this, is, this is why Adelard was so important, not just, you know, he's not just tutored to the future king. He's bringing it into... Uh, medieval Latin, completely fresh <coughs> revolutionary work, such as uh, Euclid. Now, there are some horoscopes surviving, which John North argued were cast by Adelard. He makes a plausible case that Adelard must have been the translator. And so, uh, this is one particular horoscope I just want to look at. And bears, this is the only information it has. Hec figura de adventum to quistam in Anglia, 6th of June, 1151. This figure is the arrival of a certain person in England. Okay, use of the certain person, what does that tell you? This is politically sensitive. Okay, a certain person. Why not say Henry or whoever? You don't want to be found with this horoscope in your possession by the wrong people. And these are the positions on it. The moon is here in Capricorn. The sun and Mercury are here in Gemini. Venus here in Cancer. Saturn in Cancer and Jupiter in Libra. Mars, you'll notice here, um, well, it's not included. It was not on the original manuscript. Now, the context, okay, the long civil war between Matilda and Stephen was raging, and this horoscope talks about a certain person. Before John North, people thought the certain person might be Geoffrey Plantagenet, Matilda's husband. John North said, no, actually, he, it, but I'm going to argue that it's the young Prince Henry. And, and he writes, sorry, uh, as we have seen, Henry Starr, was in the ascendant in the summer of 1151. Um, Henry was made Duke of Normandy in 1150, 
and inherited his father's own lands in France in 1151. This is the horoscope in a modern form, laid out differently, which might show you three clusters of planets. If you put in Mars, it's right here with the Moon. The Sun and Venus are here in Gemini, Mercury and Saturn here in Cancer, and there's Jupiter in Virgo. Just to represent this differently graphically to show you more clearly <coughs> the pattern. Now, the Sun has... <coughs> um, there's no interpretation which comes this, with this horoscope. But the certain person came to England. Now, we don't know if this is a horoscope to decide the moment, the, a, a good moment for the certain person to come to England, or a horoscope asking whether the certain person will come to England. We don't know if it's retrospective or done in advance. But we can still interpret it to see, is it auspicious or not, which might tell you something about what was going on. Now, so we would go to Claudius Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos, which was translated in um, 1138. Uh, um, and uh, so uh, was available, it had been translated 13 years before this horoscope was cast. And so here we have um, the sun is aspected to Saturn and Jupiter. The sun is here in Gemini. It's around 90 degrees from Saturn, a difficult square, and around 120 degrees, roughly, from Jupiter, so an easy trine. So we've got, we go back to Ptolemy, and we see um, that the trine is harmonious, the quartile, the square, that one is disharmonious. So we've kind of got a balance here. Is this horoscope auspicious or not? Well, interestingly, without knowing what's going through the mind of the astrologer, the astrologer, if it's Adelard, would know of a work called uh, On Reception, but mashallah, in which it is uh, specified that when planets are in uh, this, the two planets and the signs of each other's rulership or exaltation, they're in what's called reception. They receive each other. They become friends. So in this chart, Saturn here is in Cancer, which amongst other things for in relation to Saturn, it's opposite Saturn's rulership, that's not so good. But Saturn is in Cancer, which, as we've seen, is the sign of Jupiter's exaltation. And Jupiter is in Libra, which, as we've seen from previous examples, is the sign of Saturn's exaltation. So, in terms of the law of reception, they become friends. And indeed, in terms of what I'm saying, is they then partake in a little way of the perfection that is embodied in the horoscope of the world, which all the planets are in their exaltations. Um, so, you know, we can reconstruct on that basis. But what, what we know is that if Adelard did cast his horoscope, he would have known this perfectly well. He would have spotted this instantly, that reception between Jupiter and Saturn. And he would have said, this is friendly. There are other problems in the chart I'm not going to deal with now. Mars and the Moon are here um, in Capricorn, extremely unfortunate. Um, and Mars and the Moon, as we saw in Masha Allah's horoscope for Jesus Christ, uh, indicated Jesus Christ's crucifixion. And so, profoundly unfortunate. So there is the problem of what to do here, but this, I think, you know, Adelard would have spotted um, immediately. So the question is, you know, uh, this slide just repeats uh, what I've just said. What, what is this horoscope? Nor speculates the horoscope is an interrogation, a question. Say, will Henry come to England? 
Um, the alternative is that it's an election intended to find an auspicious time for the person to enter England. Now, can we find an auspicious time? Um, in which case, you know, the horoscope needs more examination because there's the problem of the Mars, uh, the, the Mars Moon aspect. But um, <clears throat> I think what we can, we, 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 what we can reconstruct using the rules of astrology, almost like a piece of intellectual archaeology, it's like a piece of uh, experimental archaeology, if you like, which we can reconstruct a possible reading of the chart. So, you know, experimental archaeology, you may you know, uh, perform a piece of medieval metalwork in order to see how well a piece of armour stood up to a blow from a particular sword, for example. So we can perform the same sort of exercise here. It is you know, experimental archaeology, looking at the horoscope as a piece of technology and trying to look back and see, using the astrological text at the time, how it would be interpreted. Here's another example. Um, this one, it is a question whether Richard of Burgundy would possess the throne. And you'll find this horoscope referred to in uh, Hilary Carey's book, Courting Disaster. I've just drawn it out in a medieval style here in my own hand. Let's just go on to the next slide because the short answer is yes. One year after this horoscope was cast, Richard of Burgundy was crowned Richard II. And the, horror, the manuscript contains the words, Vide quod eventus re correspondet figure secundum libros indicariales de interagitionibus. The matter eventuated as the figure indicated if interpreted according to the rules. So, this, so Richard became king. So whoever's looking at this chart and cast this chart a year before he became king looks back and says, yes, it all worked out according to the rules. The horoscope was, uh, uh, the question was asked, whatever it was, when England was in a state of crisis in the 1370s, King Edward III was old, his son Edward the Black Prince was killed, there was famine, uh, discontent in the towns, a very unfortunate treaty with France and so on. It was a difficult decade. And so, towards the end, uh, some astrologer asked the question, what's going to happen? Will Richard become king? So again, the reading is not preserved, but we can do our experimental archaeology on it. Basically, we've got here um, a moon conjunct Saturn, not Moon conjunct Mars this time, Moon conjunct Saturn. <clears throat> That's a, a very strong indication of failure. If you were a casual, careless astrologer, you might open your, quickly look at your book, where it says um, Saturn always indicates failure, and there's the Moon conjunct Saturn indicates failure. But of course Richard did become uh, king. So we have to look at other indications. Here's Jupiter. Jupiter is in Virgo, which is weak. It's rising, which is strong. This is important because Jupiter is the most benevolent planet and it's sending mixed messages. Um, <clears throat> so where do we go from here? Well, if, if we followed the rules, some Mash Allah, Abu Mishar, uh, Virgo here, the ruling planet is Mercury, which is here. Mercury is in Cancer. Uh, Cancer is ruled by the moon, which is here, and it's a third of the zodiac, a trine, which Ptolemy tells us Richard, away from the moon. So one can then find um, benevolent uh, aspects in the chart which can enable us to reconstruct it. And of course we don't know at the time what happened because this astrologer who may... Pre we don't know if the astrologer is working for Richard or allies of Richard or working independently, might have looked at the chart and at the time said, I don't know, it's a bit unequivocal, a bit equivocal. And then Richard becomes king and you look back and say, ah, yes, the positive indications are indeed uh, stronger. So there we are. It's the chart again and again. You know, we don't know uh, whether the astrologer is working alone or working for Richard 
for his allies. And then so Thomas Aquinas had, had, had things to say about this as well. So let's just wrap this up in the theology in his um, book uh, in Libros Aristoteles de, de, de Cano et Mundo Exposition. Um, he's saying, according to this then, it must be understood that the optimum in things is permanence, which in separated substances, separated substances as when fire, earth, air and water move apart, is realised without any motion at all. Um, and then at the end he says, hence it is that according to Ptolemy in his quadripartite, that's the tetrabiblos, what belongs to Saturn is attributed to the universal loci, events of times, while what belongs to Jupiter, the annual loci. So Jupiter and Saturn are there uh, dominating the big picture, Thomas Aquinas says. And within that, you look at other planets to work out the details. So for example, what belongs to Sun, Mars, Venus and Mercury, the loci of months, the phase of the moon, the daily loci. Um, so you begin with Jupiter and Saturn, and then if you're, that, those all tell you the broad sweep of history. But then if you want to know, will a certain person come to England? Will Richard de Burgundy achieve the throne? You have to bring in the other planets to give you the specific judgment. And then the other planets all have their particular positions, some of which their exaltations then relate back to the horoscope for the world. This is what William Shakespeare said about Richard in his play, Richard II. See, see, King Richard doth himself appear, as doth the blushing discontented sun from out the fiery portal of the east. Yet he looks like a king. Behold, his eye is bright as the eagle's light and force controlling majesty. So here we have the sun as the king. As we saw in Mashallah and Abu Mashallah, the sun is in the middle between, between the superior and inferior planets. It's the king. It's always the king. So let's just take a bit of a look at Shakespeare then, because my view of Shakespeare is that in his drama, he gives us the last, greatest, fullest exposition of this medieval cosmology. And his influences, you know, as a man of his time, this is nothing extraordinary, by the way, <clears throat> he's influenced by scripture, Plato, Aristotle and the Stoics. So scripture and classical philosophy. And Plato, the cosmos as a vast living machine. Aristotle, the cosmos linked by a web of psychic and physical influences and Stoicism, the cosmos as an organ of fate. And we saw right at the beginning with Empedocles that when uh, strife and love achieve dominance, then at that point the universe flies apart. This idea of this balance of stability and chaos, as we've seen, works its way through you know, the smaller level, down to Jupiter, Saturn conjunctions every 20 years. Shakespeare gives us this wonderful phrase, the time is out of joint. Um, Hamlet here, 1, 5, lines 2, 11, 2, 12. The time is out of joint, O cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. There's a wonderful fated paradox there. Hamlet couldn't help being born. Having been born, he has to set it right. He has to deal with the fact that time is out of joint. He has to, he has to be the vehicle for, to, for putting time back in joint. I've just got here the, sorry, the um, cover of Philip K. Dick's book, which references this time out of joint. Greatest piece of, one of the greatest pieces of modern science fiction. And then Shakespeare also gives us the idea of being star-crossed. Star-crossed, for example, if you have the two planets, as Ptolemy said, in square, they're difficult. Or maybe the moon-Mars conjunction in the horoscope of Christ. Difficult crucifixion. You know, it's typical. That's metaphorically star-crossed. Romeo and Juliet, star-crossed. So in King Lear, Shakespeare gives us his wonderfully full account of his backstory behind all the drama of uh, children betraying their father, a father being old and foolish, 
personal ambition, nobility, and so on. He gives us this backstory of astronomy. Set out in this great uh, passage here, King Lear, chapter 1, well, number uh, 2, in which Gloucester, who's a, one of the noble characters, gives a complete and classic description, recognisable to a medieval astrologer, to an Islamic astrologer, and earlier, of the effect of eclipses. These late eclipses in the sun and moon portend no good to us. Though the wisdom of nature can reason it thus and thus, yet nature finds itself scourged by the sequent effects. Love cools, friendship falls off, brothers divide. In cities, mutinies, in countries, discord. In palaces, treason. The bond cracks, cracks twixt son and father. And he goes on and on. The classic indications of an eclipse, of the, uh, or a series of eclipses here, lunar and solar eclipses, bringing the state to the position of, of collapse. Time, according to Hamlet, is out of joint. The whole world, from Romeo and Juliet, has become star-crossed. The state is star-crossed, not just two lovers, but the whole kingdom is star-crossed. So if we went back to Abu Mashar, um, said in, on his book on historical astrology, translated by Charles Burnett, of natural movements, another is from the middle, that's the sun, to which corresponds the movement of the great luminary, the sun, which indicates powerful kings. So the sun is eclipsed, the king is eclipsed, everything falls to bits. So this is my diagram of this. This is from King Lear, they, the complete diagram of medieval, let's call it medieval political astronomy, medieval political cosmology, medieval political astrology, using Aristotle, Plato, scripture, and astronomy. So God is always the first cause. He has to be, and planets act as secondary causes, transmitting divine intention to the world. Now, if people are born at particular times. They have their own horoscopes. They may experience bad transits, such as eclipses, um, the king here has his horoscope. Under the eclipse, he abdicates. You have individuals with bad horoscopes who forget their rightful place. Indiv uh, these are, so these are, if you know the story, uh, King Lear's two evil daughters, individuals with good horoscopes. For example, let's uh, hypothesize uh, in this sense uh, Cordelia, Lear's. Um, uh, noble daughter. So these are examples. Of course, uh, Shakespeare doesn't set out, he only sets out the astrology in general terms. So this is my reconstruction. Um, you get this collapse here. People forget their rightful place. They become victims of circumstances and other people. There's a collapse. The, the state uh, collapses. And then, uh, in all Shakespeare's tragedies, Balance is restored at the end. And it has to be because in the theory from Empedocles through Plato, through Aristotle, through Mash'Allah, through Abu Mashar in the medieval world, you always return to balance. Time flips out of joint and then it goes back in joint and harmony is restored. Now, um, Shakespeare was uh, finishing off his last plays when Johann Kepler, a great exponent of Plato, was writing. Um, Kepler had, Kepler really, in his rhetoric, rejected all traditional astrology. He rejected, the, in his rhetoric, the concept of the, the horoscope. He cast horoscopes, but his, he aimed to create a slimmed down astrology consisting only of planetary cycles which could use bees to more effectively manage the state. Because clearly he, he, he thought astrology at, at this point had failed to manage the world 
peacefully. So he came back to, as we saw from um, earlier, the, the idea of uh, free will. So he said, look, these remedies are always in our power, however things may happen, and nothing is absolutely predetermined. He's saying, look, we can do something about it. We don't have to allow difficult planetary aspects. And one example he used was of a Mars uh, Saturn, difficult Mars Saturn aspect, which bring, would bring violence. He said, we don't have to allow these things to spiral into political chaos. And he said, for although the sun shines upon and warms the whole world, yet it does not produce olive trees everywhere except where they have been planted. You know, um, so individual circumstances have to be taken into account. Local circumstances have to be taken into account. Astrology can only tell you so much. Look at real conditions and what's going on. Then he said, um, once such problems have been foreseen, uh, um, he said this, a great safeguard for the army lies in their loyalty to and high regard for their commander, for every victory depends on a driving force of the spirit. So, again, uh, human relationships are more important here than the uh, abstract rules of what astronomy or astrology might or might not say. And King Lear was also written um, immediately before Galileo uh, looked through his telescope in 1610 and then published a great work called Sidereus Nuncius in, 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 uh, sorry, in 1610, a work which ricocheted throughout Europe, destroying faith, destroying the fabric of medieval cosmology, to which uh, John Donne in 1611 in response wrote this poem here, Anatomy of the World, a new philosophy said, calls all in doubt, the element of fire is quite put out, the sun is lost, and the earth and no man's wit can well direct him where to look for it. And freely men confess that this world spent, when in the planets and the firmament they seek so many new Tis all in pieces, all coherence gone, he concluded. So that was a very precise moment. Brings the great centuries, the great period of medieval cosmology to an end. And that's the end of my lecture.